Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm Megan Marino. I'm a water use efficiency specialist with the Alameda County Water District, and I'll be um, talking briefly before we hand it over to Chris just about some logistics. So yeah, go ahead and next slide. Um, today, all attendees will be muted by default, but we are encouraging questions. So there's two ways to ask. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A, or if really urgent, you may raise your hand but we will save time for questions at the end. So please uh, reserve the raise hand function for the last bit of the webinar. And this is recorded, so all the slides and content will be posted to YouTube and ACWD's website as well as the Bosco website for later viewing. The Alameda County Water District um, has a mission to provide reliable a reliable supply of high quality water at a reasonable price to our customers. Next slide. We serve Fremont, Newark, and Union City. So that's about 105 square miles with over 344,000 customers and 84,000 connections. We've been longstanding in this industry. We were founded in 1914 and we have three sources of supply. So if you go back to the last slide, we have three sources of supply. 40% um, of our water comes from the state water project, or excuse me, yeah, 40% state water project, 40% um, from the Alameda Creek watershed runoff, and, and the remaining comes from the SFPUC. You know, we purchase water from them, which is comes from Hetch Hetchy. So this is a very diverse water supply portfolio, allowing us to have more reliability in case one supply has issues or um, in drought, this is really beneficial. Next slide. We offer a variety of programs for our residential customers that we encourage you all to take advantage of. One being the water conservation kits. Those are free kits that we can send right to your door with water efficient devices. The turf replacement program, which is our most popular program, which we offer $2 per square foot to change out your water thirsty lawn to beautiful water efficient landscaping. We offer landscape workshops like tonight and um, uh, seasonal irrigation notices as well as an irrigation hardware rebate. So if you have above ground sprinklers or spray heads, we do offer an incentive to replace those with more efficient ones with our irrigation hardware rebate. What you may be interested in tonight is our rain barrel rebate program. So we offer $50 per rain barrel for a maximum of two uh, rain barrels. So you can receive up to $100 to install rain barrels and they must be at least 50 gallons per barrel. But all you need is to keep your receipt from the barrel and take snap a few photos of the installation and upload it. And we can reimburse you with a check in the mail. So when you're hearing more about how to install these rebate or rain barrels, please be thinking about participating in the rebate program. A little bit more about the details of the program. Um, I mentioned they must be at least 50 gallons because we want to maximize that water savings. And there are additional resources, including recommendations from the Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District safe practices, as well as how to design and store and keep the water clean all on acwd.org forward slash rebates. So for proper setup, you can use fine mesh screening or seal designs for debris, debris and mosquito control. We want to connect it to a rain gutter or downspout, rain chain or other effective means. You want to place it on a solid foundation and make sure you're not blocking any walkways. And you'll hear more from Chris on how to properly install the rain barrel. A little bit about our partner tonight, Bosca. It's a, a group of 26 different agencies all around the Bay Area that have come together on the common um, commonality that we all buy water from San Francisco Public Utilities. So that's at Hetch Hetchy Water. And all combined, they serve over 1.8 million people and 40,000 businesses in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties. They have a similar goal, which is to supply high quality water at a fair price. If you like tonight's webinar, there are many more coming up, um, including even one tomorrow, 
on water conservation rebates, water savings, water wise winter color for habitat gardens, and several more you can see on the screen, including another rain garden one late in December. If you go to uh, bosca.org forward slash conserve forward slash landscaping videos. So tonight's program objectives is to focus on outdoor water use, which represents the single largest untapped opportunity for conservation in the Bay Area, and two, for outdoor water use reduction through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques like rainwater capture to help conserve and ensure that the future water supply meets the needs of our communities. Just a quick disclaimer, in this, is, this presentation is not to be um, is not intended to be exhaustive and more general in nature and that any views expressed tonight does not necessarily reflect the policies of ACWD or BOSCA and that the presentation and structure information and products and materials are provided as a courtesy, but not necessarily endorsed. So one quick announcement, uh, the Alameda County Water District is now on Spotify. So if you're chilling in your garden, or um, maybe on a quick walk, we encourage you to check out our playlist. It's really fun and uh, we have songs for every age. If you have additional questions, I'll be a resource here tonight. So you can, you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A for myself, but we also have our phone number and email on the screen, water.cons at ecwd.com to get a hold of us. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our speaker for tonight, Chris Corvetti. Chris moved to California as a member of the Watershed Stewards AmeriCorps program, where she delved into issues surrounding water conservation specific to the Bay Area. Since the end of her AmeriCorps service in 2017, Chris has worked with numerous local nonprofits and municipalities to install rainwater harvesting systems throughout the Bay. So we're honored tonight for Chris to take it away. I'm going to go ahead and um, go off video, but I will be responding to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We are here to talk about rainwater harvesting, which is kind of, you know, a big topic. So I figured I would start on the grand scale and then narrow it down. And it doesn't get much more grander than looking at the whole watershed. So the one of the big things about rainwater harvesting and why it's so important for the Bay Area is because it is a way to reduce polluted runoff. So I want to talk a little bit about polluted runoff, and then we'll talk about how rainwater harvesting can help with that and how it can bring you benefits just on your own property as well as in the larger community. So starting out in the larger community, we have the watershed. And when it rains, we have our water comes down and watershed is the area where all the water that falls within that area runs to one large water source. So we are all in the San Francisco Bay area, San Francisco Bay watershed. But then you'll also be part of a smaller watershed, which is the creek um, or near your home that ultimately flows into the San Francisco Bay. So. The water moves through a watershed, like you can see in this picture with all these white arrows, but it kind of gets held up and has a funky effect when it hits all the hardscapes that we have in our communities. So if we zoom in a little bit on a house in our neighborhood, we see these hardscapes. We have the road, we have a house, we have a driveway, and all of those areas, the water can't soak into the ground. So instead you get runoff and it runs over the yards, over the hardscapes and ends up in our storm drains. Now this runoff can pick up all sorts of pollutants that can affect our creeks and ultimately the bay. Um, if a couple of those pollutants are listed here, pet waste, fertilizers, motor oils, detergents, chemicals, litter, and there's many more little bits of plastic um, that fish will think are food and can make them sick. Um, soaps that can also harm our fish and harm our creek um, health. So storm drains go straight into the creeks. They are not filtered. This is something that 
I've heard a lot when I ask about where where our storm drains go. Everyone says, oh, they go to the treatment plant and it gets cleaned. But our storm drains actually don't. All of our household waste, so our sinks, our toilets, our showers, all of that on, on the left-hand side of the screen, they go to the water treatment plant and they get cleaned and they come out clean at the other end and are reused for irrigation water and and are clean and ready. Anything in the storm drain goes straight into the bay carrying all of those pollutants like you can see in the bottom right of this picture. So one of the ways that we can reduce that polluted runoff is by slowing the water down, spreading it out, and sinking it into the ground. So the more water that we can get infiltrating into the ground rather than going into our system as runoff, the less pollution that water can carry. So that's kind of bringing the big picture down to our local homes. But it raises kind of a big question. You know, we live in the Bay Area. We don't get a lot of water. So is there really enough rain to make this worth it? So let's take a look at the numbers. A thousand square foot roof can capture over 600 gallons of rainwater from one inch of rain. That's great. Let's let's see what that really means. So here's our equation with our conversion factor. Now, we live in the Bay Area. We sometimes get crazy storms like last year where we had a seven inch storm. But more often we get storms like we had last week where it's, you know, a quarter inch or a half inch of rain. So looking at a half inch of rain, that's still 310 gallons. Alameda County gets an average of 17 inches of rain per year. So with a pretty small watershed of 1,000 square feet, that's over 10,000 gallons of water that could potentially be used and harvest and sunk into the ground rather than running off into our storm drains. Now, 17 inches doesn't seem like a lot. It's really not a lot. We don't get a lot of rain in the Bay Area. The U.S. average is about 18 inches of precipitation for year. So we have a lot less here. But if you think about all the water that starts flowing down the sides of the roads or flooding on the side of our highways when it's barely even raining here. So even, even in that half inch of rain, we get flooding in our local communities. So this is a great way to reduce that flooding and reduce the pollution and then have water to use once the storm has passed and once once we are once again dry. So we're going to talk a little bit about different ways of harvesting that water and using it later. Um, but before that, I just want to briefly touch on roof types. Everybody always wants to make sure that this is going to work on their house. So all of these roof types, um, sorry about that. Uh, all of these roof types that are pictured, which my connection just stopped, will work um, for rainwater harvesting. Okay, hopefully that came back. Is it? Megan, can you unmute yourself and just let me know if you're seeing it full screen or if it's doing something funky? What was that? Is the screen showing up properly? Mm, you're not sharing your screen. Okay, well, that's good to know. Let's try that again. Sorry about this, folks. How about now? Yes, yeah, so you can see the roof types. Yeah, and are all eight pictures showing or is it just showing six of them? It's eight. Excellent. Okay, my screen has decided to only show half the screen. Um, so all of these roof types will work. These are the most common roof types we have here in the Bay Area. Um, the roof types that you want to avoid for rainwater harvesting are untreated metal 
So something like galvanized metal or an uncoated copper, because you're going to get more of the metal in and the rust into your system. And because we're harvesting the water, you'll actually be concentrating those pollutants in your water from, from your roof. So you want to avoid those. Same thing with um, treated wood, cedar, or, shing or shake shingles. Um, if you're putting an algicide on your roof annually or an herbicide annually on your roof, you really don't want to be using that to water your garden because it's going to kill your plants in your garden, just like it prevents plants from growing on your roof. Um, I've had people come up to me and say, well, I have a shake roof. I don't know if it's getting treated. If you're not paying someone to go up there and treat your roof, your roof's not getting treated. Um, you know if you're you know if you're putting chemicals on your own roof. Uh, so that's that something you should know if if you are looking to do a system. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the types of rainwater. So we have four main types of rainwater harvesting. We're going to talk about rain barrels and cisterns as one topic tonight because they really do set up the same way. A rain barrel is a smaller size than a cistern. Anything over 200 gallons, we consider a cistern. So this picture on bottom um, is a 365 gallon tank. The one on the top left is a 50 gallon tank. So we would consider the 50 gallon to be a rain barrel and the one that's over 300, 365 gallons would be a cistern. Uh, they both are included in the, the rain barrel rebate. They aren't separate in the system for that. Um, rain gardens, we're going to discuss quite a bit today and how they differ from a standard garden and what makes them special. And then pervious pavement. Pervious pavement, we're, we're only going to talk about briefly. Um, it's a great way to slow it, spread it, and sink it. And it's a great way to reduce those impermeable services around your house. So one of the things you can do is take non-permeable pavers and just let space between them. So you guys will see a lot of the local um, businesses, Home Depots around here have them in their parking spaces farther away from the building where they have these kind of diamond cut blocks for the parking spaces. And those allow the rainwater to sink into the ground and soak through. But there's also something called permeable asphalt. It's not great for roads, but it is used for parking spaces. Um, this picture here on the top right is in Palo Alto um, on Middlefield Road at the library, which name just escaped me. Um, and so they, you can see this is normal paving here where I'm drawing the red line, but all of these parking spots are the permeable asphalt. And so it does look a little different and it doesn't handle being driven on at speed well, but it doesn't, it, it's very safe for parking and it's great for sidewalks. There are a lot of sidewalks and local parks in Alameda County that have the permeable asphalt for their sidewalks so that they aren't adding any more hardscapes. Um, you can see in this bottom picture that the water just flows straight through the porous cement, the porous permeable asphalt. And the way that it works is it's dug out and you can see in this left picture, the there is a sub base that's usually a form of drainage rock and then a, a base that would be some form of a sand usually and then a, a bedding, a gravel or sand bedding that the pervious pavement, pervious pavement is paved over. So that allows the water to have a lot of space to be able to soak into the ground without ending up flooding and having that fill up. So they are engineered and designed to be able to allow that water to sink in more efficiently. So I'm going to move forward and talk about rain barrels and cisterns now, and we'll get a little more in depth with those. And then we'll move on to rain gardens. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A. And if my presentation, if my uh, slides don't show up right, please let me know.
So rain barrels and cisterns capture runoff from the roof to store for later use. Um, this is great because when we get that flashiness of the rain, it reduces the flooding. It reduces the extra water around your home and then gives you water to use later after that storm when things are starting to dry out so that you're not using as much municipal water and you're able to keep that potable water for indoor house use. Um, it's going to help m minimize the moisture around your building foundation because it's however many gallons, even if it's just 50 gallons that you're capturing, that's 50 gallons less water going into the ground right next to your home. Um, we've already talked about how it'll improve the water quality in creeks because you're going to be reducing the amount of water that runs off into the streets and is able to carry the pollutants into our creeks. And it's a great educational tool to just make more people aware of water issues in our area. Most people in the Bay Area know that we've been in a drought for many years and that we struggle for, for good water during the dry season for our plants. Um, this picture on the left is an adapted wine barrel. It's at Gamble Gardens in Palo Alto. Um, wine barrels are not included in the rebate, but they are a very, a, can be a very attractive way to do a rain barrel installation. So let's take a quick look at the anatomy of the rain barrel. There are four main components to the rain barrel. The inflow, where the water runs in. The overflow, where the water escapes. The output, where you're going to use the water. And then the tank itself. Right? So, as the water comes into your tank, you need to have screening. So in this system, you can see there's something called a leaf eater, which acts as the screening. And then this tank actually has a screen here as well that you can't see in the picture. So this has two screens in the top going in. The other place that it's really important to have screening is at the overflow. And that's right there. And that screen is there. These screens get cleaned about four times a year minimally. And they're just going to keep extra debris out of your tank. They're going to keep mosquitoes from getting in. They're going to help keep your system clean. Um, there are a couple optional things that are on here. We have strapping. This was also installed at Gamble Gardens, which is a public site in Palo Alto. So we have to be concerned about people climbing on tanks or if in an event of a really bad earthquake, the tank falling over and the potential of someone being there. So we strap this for earthquake proofing. If you're installing this on your own home, you want to have it on a secure and level base. In this case, we have a cement paved area that we're installed on. So it's very secure and level. Um, and you have the option to strap it to add earthquake proofing. It is not a requirement. Uh, I do recommend doing it just especially if you have kids. Uh, but the the tanks get very heavy. So water weighs a little over eight, eight pounds per gallon. So when you get up to a large tank like this one, this one is 265 gallons. Once you get up to such a large tank, it gets really, really heavy. So 265 gallons times a little bit over eight pounds per gallon is over one ton of weight. So over 2,000 pounds. Um, so having it secure and level is good. The more level it is, the less likely it's going to be to move. Um, for your output, you want to really think about how you're going to use your system. So this system is set up with two options for the output. It has one option that runs into a rain garden and it's kind of like a quick emptying of the barrel. If you open that up, all the water just runs into a rain garden and dumps all the water out. So Gamble Garden does this before they're expecting a big storm so that they're able to capture more water during the next storm. 
there's also in this one a hose that comes out on the on the upper output picture there's a hose that comes out and they hose water a garden nearby you can set up drip timers um and drip irrigation or a soaker hose the system that's pictured in the bottom has two separate ones coming off the same tank one's going to a drip timer and one's going to a soaker hose around a redwood tree um with any of the irrigation options that you're going to do you're going to want to install screening at the output as well and that's going to be a super fine screen it's pretty hard to see here in the picture sorry about that but it's going to be a super fine mesh screen and that's just going to take any particulates out so that your drip irrigation system doesn't clog because you don't want those output um, holes in the drip irrigation to clog up. So there's lots of ways that you can use the water uh, depending on your system. So one of the other great options with a rain rainwater system is if you want to get that large capacity that a cistern has, but you just don't have the space for a large system, you can daisy chain barrels together. So the barrels on the left here are each 50 gallon barrels. So the two of them gives you a hundred gallon capacity. These barrels are um, earth-minded rain station barrels. So the top of them is actually designed as a planter box and you're able to plant plants in them to get a little bit more of an attractive or decorative look to your rain barrel. Uh, the ones on the right are 55 gallons each for a total 220 gallon capacity. These are recycled food grade barrels. So food grade barrels are able to be used once and then they are considered done with their food grade life. And at that point, finding a new life for them and repurposing them is really a great way to get a rain barrel. Um, they're often much cheaper to purchase, um, usually in the $30 to $40 range, whereas the earth-minded rain stations, I believe, are more in the $70 to $100 range. Um, the earth-minded rain stations are designed to be a rain barrel. They have not been used before, whereas the blue barrels you are repurposing. Um, so daisy chaining, what this slide is actually about, allows for larger systems and you can easily add on additional systems. So both of these are daisy chained on the bottom. So on the one on the left, if you see where I'm drawing my red line, you've got this gray pipe. So the water is coming down the downspout and into the barrel on the left. And then it's coming down into this pipe that goes across the bottom. And it is actually filling both tanks simultaneously because water seeks its own level. So the, they will fill at the same time. And the blue one is doing the same thing. Um, but the blue one, the plumbing is actually underneath it. So you can't see it. Uh, the other option is to connect the overflows. So your first tank will fill and then it will overflow into the second tank and the second tank will fill and so on. Um, either one is a great way to work the system. If you're going to be running drip irrigation, I usually prefer to connect them at the bottom because it gives you a little bit more even pressure um, having the water in all of the barrels so you get a better drip irrigation. Uh, it's very easy to add on an additional barrel. So if you say, I want to start with two barrels and then you really get into it, you really like it, but you're not your, your water is only lasting you through part of August and you want to add another barrel or two on to be able to get all the way into the next rain, it's really easy to add that in. Um, if, um, if you are in certain uh, cities under the Bosco region, if you do a system that's over 200 gallons, it does qualify for a cistern rebate, but not all cities have that program. So you would have to check for your city specifically. Uh, when you're choosing your system, you really want to think about your roof size or your harvesting potential, how many downspouts you want to capture from and where they're located. 
you want to think about the space, right? You don't want to block any pathways. You don't want to you don't want to put it somewhere where it's going to make your life more difficult. You want to have a space where this is going to work without being in your way. You want to think about drainage or overflow. You can't run your rain barrel overflow onto your neighbor's property. It's got to be on your own property, at least three feet from the property line. Even if you're really frustrated with your neighbor, you can't flood them out. So you got to make sure you have enough space for that overflow to be on your own property and to be able to sink in the ground away from your foundation. Um, one of the great ways to, to do that is actually to connect to a rain garden, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, you want to think about aesthetics. So if you're pretty artsy, which I am not, you could decorate your barrel like this and have it blend in with your garden and or look really pretty. Um, I do not have that kind of skills with a paintbrush. So I would probably be more inclined if I was going to put something in the front of my house on uh, putting in one of the rain stations with the, the planter on top uh, or finding a local student with better artistic skills to paint a barrel for me. And also just thinking about the cost, um, depending on the size of your barrel, you know, the cost does go up and you can balance that against what you'll save with water and hassle because these are pretty low maintenance systems. Um, you do not need a permit for most of these, uh, any of the pictures that I'm showing and for most installations, as long as you are under 360 gallons and plumbed fully exterior to a single family home, you are all set. You can use the water for with a watering can, with a hose, with drip irrigation, and you're all set. If you go over 360 gallons, you cannot be connected to an electrical supply, you cannot be connected to a makeup water supply, and you cannot hose or water with a watering can. But between 360 gallons and 5,000 gallons, you can set up a system without a permit if you are just using drip irrigation. So if you get really excited and you decide to buy a 500 gallon tank, you can set it up, but it needs to be set up with drip irrigation. Um, if you are doing any of anything um, that doesn't meet those above exemptions, if you want to install a below ground system or connect to interior plumbing, you need a permit. Um, the main main question a lot of people ask me is, can I use this water to flush my toilet? The answer is with a permit. So anytime you're going to try to bring this water in to use it and connect it to anything else in the house, you need a permit. Um, what this also means is you are not going to be connecting to your, your existing irrigation system without a permit. So if you want to set up the rain barrels and run your own drip irrigation system, that's great. Um, we're going to send out an email to participants, I believe. Uh, Megan's going to send out an email and we'll include a link to drip irrigation supplies that work great with rain barrels and they are meant to be gravity fed. Um, so one of the things, and I have a question here um, about not connecting it to electricity. So if you are wanting to be able to do a you know a small system so 300 300 gallon system and you want to use a pump to get a little bit more pressure in your system to run a hose um you can do that if you are um doing a temporary pump setting so if you want to set up a pump that is installed full time you're going to need a permit because you're hardwiring electric. If you are bringing a pump that is not hardwired and that you're just plugging in an exterior outlet while you're using it and then you're unplugging it and putting it back in your shed, then you're fine. So there are different types of pumps. Um, and if you're doing a hard a hardwired pump that is always hooked up, that does fall under the permit. Hopefully that answered that question for you. Um, 
And yeah, so any irrigation would be set up as a separate system. People often get a little intimidated when I say that, but it works out really well because you run a secondary irrigation drip system to the plants that you want to water, and then you can just turn off your normal municipal irrigation to that zone while you have enough water in your tank and you have your water on your timer to run your drip irrigation to that zone. And then if you run out of your rainwater in in the fall, in the late summer, you are still have your pre-existing system in place to be able to make that up. So with a smaller system, especially people that install just a 50 gallon tank, 50 gallons, depending on how much you're watering, probably is not gonna get you through the entire dry system by itself. Um, so I have a question here. How can the water be used in a garden without drip irrigation? Um, if you're under uh, 360 gallons, you can water with a watering can or water with a hose. Um, so it's just like you would normally water with a watering can or hose. Um, there's a question here. Could you add an additional 5,000 gallon tank without a permit? You cannot add any 5,000 gallon tank without a permit. Um, so if you had, um, if you wanted to add a 4,999 gallon tank with drip irrigation, then you don't need a permit. And if you wanted to add an additional 4,000 gallon tank on another part of your house to another downspout, you do not need a permit as long as they're not connected because they're separate systems. So the idea is for most people, it would be more likely 50 gallon tanks. If you wanted to put a 50 gallon tank on the downspout on the front right corner of your house, and then another one on the front left corner of your house, and you're not connecting them to each other in any way, those are separate systems their combined size does not fall under this. So if I did a 200 gallon tank and then another 200 gallon tank and they're not connected in any way, I'm still under the 360 gallons. Um, I have a question, is there an opening to get watering can in the barrel? No, you would not get the watering can in the barrel. Let's take a look at the next slide for this. There will be a faucet for you to fill from. So as you can see on these barrels, there's a spigot that you can get a watering can under. This spigot happens to be really, really low on that third barrel, but you could put a riser on it or put set this up on a couple of cinder blocks so you would be able to get a watering can under it. Or you could install a short five or six foot hose to help you fill your watering cans. Um, this system here has a hose attached right there that fills the watering cans. And this one got cut off, but there is a hose here as well. Um, there's a great question here. Is there a list of specific parts needed to link multiple rain barrels and a list of sources for them? Um, so if you're gonna do blue barrel systems, they uh, set up everything in a kit and you purchase everything directly from them in a kit. If you want to get one of these other systems, they usually come with a full kit included to install one tank, and you can buy a connector to, to kit that connects them at the overflow level. If you want to collect connect them on bottom, you would have to go to Home Depot and just buy the individual parts, um, essentially just running a pipe between. Um, basic kits like the ones on the left, they're usually 50 to 90 gallons. You can find them at your local hardware store or online. Food grade barrels, uh, blue barrel bluebarrelsystems.com is the website, which we'll give you a link to in the follow-up email. Um, they, they do their whole kit um, through their website and they, they give you very specific instructions and videos on their website to help you install it on your own. Other food grade barrels, you would just get a basic earth-minded diverter kit, which you can order through Amazon. Um, cisterns generally are not going to have a kit. So once you decide to go the cistern route, 
which you can buy locally at Urban Farmer in San Francisco or San Lorenzo Lumber in Santa Cruz. I don't know of any actually in Alameda County that um, keep these in stock. They're pretty big and take up a lot of floor space for um, for hardware stores to keep them in stock. Um, they generally do not come with the plumbing, but it's all basic pipe thread plumbing and very easy to purchase the materials at a local hardware store. Um, if you are interested in learning how these can be installed, keep an eye on the Flows to Bay website. They often do installations uh, that invite local community members to come out and do a hands-on installation so that you can learn how to do it and take those skills home. So that's that's a great website, which is at the end of the program as well as in the email. Um, maintaining your, your barrels. So they are pretty low maintenance, but you do need to clean out your gutters. If they look like the gutters in this picture at the top, uh, your systems really aren't gonna work well and they're gonna get heavy and your gutters might even fall off your house. That's a pretty clogged up gutter, but you wanna clean them two, twice a year. Uh, you want to check and empty the leaf eater or clean your screening at least four times a year. That's going to just make sure that your screen's not damaged, make sure you're keeping those mosquitoes out, and just make sure that they're not gummed up so water can still get in and out of your system properly. Um, you want to empty and clean your first flush diverter. We didn't really talk about first flush diverters. They're an optional add-on if you're in a high dust area. Those need to be cleaned twice a year. Um visually inspect all valves and components once a year. Um, and then I recommend draining your system using all of your harvested water at least every five years. Ideally, you're going to use that water after every storm and then let your system refill. And then every five years or so, you might want to just take a hose and, you know, disconnect your drip irrigation and just take a hose and rinse the barrels out, get some of the fine sediment out of the bottom and just let that rinse out and that's going to let your system work a little bit more efficiently. So it is important to use your rainwater. You want to use it regularly, empty it between storms. So you can, like we said, we can connect it to a pump that you're plugging into an outlet and using and then putting the pump away where it's a temporary system. Um, but these systems work great with gravity, just, just using a hose or watering can to, and drip irrigation, to just use a gravity fed. Um, you can use them to fill a bird bath or landscape area. They're great for washing tools. I know people use rainwater for washing their cars. Um, you can water your garden or landscaping and just trying to sink this water into the ground to increase groundwater storage. Um, we already talked about permits are required if you want to connect it to toilets, but one of the great ways to use your rainwater is to sink it into a rain garden. So if, I'm going to move on to rain gardens, but I'm going to give you guys a couple seconds to type any more questions about rain barrels, and we will do more questions at the end. So if you don't think of one now, we'll, we'll get to it at the end, but just a couple Couple seconds to ask any rain barrel questions before we move on to rain gardens. Okay, well, we had some good questions already and if you guys think of more, um, type them in or you can raise your hand when we get to the end. So, what makes a rain garden different than your standard landscaping or garden? Rain gardens are actually engineered gardens. They're designed to capture, store, and infiltrate the rainwater. They allow more water to soak into the ground than a traditional garden. Um, typically, you actually remove your native soil or at least amend it for a rain garden. Um, we recommend native plants. Uh, they'll require less maintenance and um, less watering in between storms. They are designed to pond, but only temporary. So these are not a pond feature. They're actually dry most of the time. So this picture on the left is at Half Moon Bay High School. 
And the water comes off of their science building and down this downspout in the back of this image. Oops. The water then comes through a pipe underground and up and into the rain barrel. Once the rain barrel is filled, it comes into this overflow pipe, which goes into the top of this rain garden. So during the dry season, this rain garden kind of just looks like a pile of rocks with some junkus in it. But when it rains, it does fill up a little bit with water and it does a little bit of temporary ponding and that water is able to soak in. So it's a really great resource because previously all this water went out onto the road and flooded their their driveway and their parking lot. They don't have that flooding issue now, which is awesome. Uh, let's take a look at the traditional anatomy of a rain garden. Um, so we have this dug out area, right? Where you dig it out and you're loosening up all your soil and you're digging it out and that's going to be anywhere from 12 to 24 inches deep total um minimally you need at least six inches at the top for ponding and you can have river rocks in there and that will still help with your ponding because the water is going to fill in between the rocks. River rocks will kind of help stabilize your biosoil soil as well, keep it from floating away. And I personally like the way the rocks look. You can create a dry creek bed, um, which I think can be quite attractive. So our overall depth is at least a minimum of 12 inches, maximum of 24 usually. Um. At the top, we have those river rocks, and then in the middle, we have this bioswale soil. This needs to be, ooh, sorry about that. Come on. This needs to be at least three inches deep to give your plants a little bit of room. I actually like to go a little bit deeper with the bioswale soil. And then at the bottom, we have drainage rock, which also needs to be at least three inches deep. So there's our minimum of 12 inches. It's a 336 to get your minimum of 12. Um, usually I like to go a little bit deeper. I like to keep at least three inches of drainage rock, but get a, maybe three or six inches of bioswale soil just to give my plants a little bit more soil to soak into. Bioswale soil is an amended soil. So you can get that by taking your natural soil and mixing in sand and compost. You can purchase bioswale soil already made up. Linkso sells it as well as some other um, hardware stores and garden centers in the area. Um, but it's, it's a sandier soil with compost and organic material in it that is going to both provide nourishment for the plants as well as allow that water to drain really well. So it wants the water to drain efficiently. We don't want a lot of clay in our rain garden. Um, in the bottom, the drainage rock is also going to give that water room to sit as it soaks into the ground. I recommend using mulch on the berms, on the raised areas on the side of the garden to allow um, more moisture to stay in the soil and just help the garden function overall. Uh, one of the big issues we have here in the Bay Area is our soil gets um, really dry and it clays up and it and it repels the water. So during the dry season, the soil isn't able to capture the water and isn't able to soak the water. And this will help solve that problem and keep the soil able to process water all year. Um and it'll reduce a lot of that topsoil runoff that we see in the beginning of the rainy season. So when you're planning out your garden, you do want to be at least 10 feet from your home. And you still want to be at least three feet from your property line. You can't flood your flood your neighbors. Um, there are some, some tests that you can do that we're going to talk a little bit about assessing your native soil and testing your drainage capacity. Um, but let's talk a little bit about sizing. 
I do have a quick question here about how a rain garden is different from a drainage swale. A drainage swale doesn't have these layers and it's usually much deeper than six inches. So at the top of this, your rain garden is only six inches deep because we've filled back in most of what was excavated. Um, so drainage swale, um, you know, rain garden is in many ways a type of drainage swale, but not all drainage swales are rain gardens. Um, I also have a question if there's companies that can design a rain garden for you. I would refer you to the Flows to Bay and the Bosco website. They both have a list of installers that can help help with the design. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sizing and you know doing. Do, we'll talk about how to do your own design. So when you're looking at your rear rain garden, you can use those calculations we looked at before for harvesting potential. Um, but you can also just use this chart that Valley Water provides to give you a rough estimate. In general, you want your garden to be about a third the size of the roof area that you're harvesting from, but you're not looking at your whole square footage of your house. Um, so in this case, if we're looking at this front red dotted area, we have two downspouts that are in that area. And this homeowner has decided to run both of those downspouts into the rain garden. So in that case, they're going to measure that whole roof area. Had they, however, decided that they only wanted to run one downspout, we'll say this downspout, into the rain garden, then they would only measure the area of the roof that runs into that downspout. So essentially this half the roof. Does that make sense, hopefully? Um, I've had people say, well, how do I get up and measure my roof? I don't want to get on ladders and, you know, I don't know what the slope of my roof is. The slope of your roof doesn't matter because water falls straight down. So measure from the, the, even to the peak of your roof at ground level and then measure the width of your roof from that downspout that you're looking at from ground level. You can also look at your house on Google Earth and use their measure tool. It's reasonably accurate, but a good old fashioned measuring tape and two people um, is is usually the fastest way. Um, to get your square footage, you're gonna measure the width times the length, and that's gonna give you your square footage, and then that gives you the estimate for the square footage of the garden. So if you wanna take a look, if you're worried that your garden's not gonna be able to drain, properly if you have a lot of flooding issues already around your downspouts and you're worried that it's not going to drain well. You can dig a hole at least six inches deep and at least four inches um, in a circle. Place something across the top so that you can measure from the center. Fill the hole. Measure how long it takes to drain. This is going to give you a rough estimate of how well your soil is going to drain. Um, one of the things that you can do is make a graph. So check it every five minutes and see how much has drained each five minutes and plot it on a little graph to see if your drainage rate is pretty even or if it slows down as you get to the bottom of the hole, which is pretty common. If it takes um, if it takes more than an hour, keep coming back and checking and figure out if your water's not gone after a number of hours, you may not want to put a rain garden here. It, it just may not have enough infiltration. Um, you also, because of the way our soil here in, in the Bay Area is, you may want to try another test site 10 feet away from the first one because sometimes the soil is just that funky. Um, I've had sites where it was really clayey and we moved 10 feet over and we had really great drainage. So we just we just get some funky patches of clay in this area. Um, just keep track of things. If it's really compacted and really difficult to dig, um, if it's really dry, sometimes the water won't soak in because the soil is just in so much shock it can't handle the water. 
So what you can do is fill the hole, let it soak in, and then do the test again and use the second set of numbers once the soil has been reacclimated to water. Um, if you're doing this test after a heavy rain and there's already water in the hole, maybe wait till that has a chance to drain and then tie the test again. Um, you can test how much clay is in your soil with a ribbon test. So you're just going to get the soil kind of into a doughy ball in the palm of your hands by adding water. And then you're going to kind of make a fist with your thumb sticking straight up and kind of squeeze your thumb against the side of your forefinger, pushing that soil up and seeing how tall you can make it stand before it falls over. So if you can get a, a ribbon that's more than two inches and your soil just feels like clay, um, it's really not a great option for a rain garden because you just have so much clay in the soil. But anything less than two inches, you're 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 not going to have a problem with it. Um, if the soil doesn't remain in ball form at all, you already have really sandy soil. So you may not need to amend the soil very much for the rain garden. So you can just add a little bit of compost into it and use your own sandy soil back into the rain garden. But you're going to loosen it up by digging it out and it's going to help with the drainage because you don't want it to be really compacted. Um, when you're locating your rain garden, you want to be at least 10 feet away from your foundation, preferably not uphill from your home. You know, you want the water to flow down away from the home, at least three feet away from the property line, which I feel like we've covered a few times. Um, you want to check for buried utilities. So call 811. It's a free service. They will come out and, um, check for you. They'll mark everything. You want to try to be five feet horizontally and one foot vertically away from any utilities. Um, and if you are on a septic system and not a sewer system, you really don't want to be near it. You don't want to build over it. You want to know where your septic system is and avoid that because you don't want to add more additional moisture into that, that pro process. Um, avoid large tree roots. So you don't want to be digging if you're underneath the branches of a tree you're probably going to be digging into their roots so you want to be outside the branches of any large trees to try to avoid any large tree roots um if your property is really sloped you can use your excavated soil to create a berm downhill to kind of create to level level out your rain garden so you don't have to dig down twice as far you don't have to worry about that you can you can build it up so there are ways to, to make your landscape work for you. Um, you also want to use some sort of cobbles or, or stone where the water's ru running into your rain garden to help support the dirt there so that it doesn't wash out from, from the water running in fast. So even if you decide not to use cobbles in the top of your garden, you decide to use mulch having having some cobbles right where that water first hits the rain garden is very useful um bosca has a really extensive plant list on their website um, which we'll also send you a link to it's an excel spreadsheet and can be sorted by rain gardens so those are the lists that um if you're in one of the areas that does um have the rain barrel specific rebate, um, which Alameda County Water District just has the lawn be gone rebate, which a rain garden will cover from. But if you are doing the the any of the Bosca lawn be gone rebates, they have the plants list that are eligible and you can sort by rain garden. Within that search, it doesn't really list where in the rain garden you can put it. So you can do your own research and see that, you know, plants like California poppy probably aren't going to be as happy down in the soil. They're going to want to be up on the raised berm, um, but certain plants uh, like juncus or wild lilac are going to be totally happy getting flooded out and then dried again. So they're going to be fine in that lower area. So just doing a little bit of research on the plants that you plant to make sure they're going to be happy getting their feet wet and then coming back from that. One of the questions that I always get when I start talking about plants is, can I put edible plants in my rain garden? 
And unfortunately, the short answer is no. Not inside the rain garden, not in the area that you're excavating. But as soon as you get outside of that area onto the berm, you are totally fine to add edible plants. You really want to think about what you're adding now. Things that are really good are vining veggies, bushy berries, and tall, tall vegetables or in citrus or any other fruit trees. They do really, really well being watered with rainwater and being in, in, a, in the edges of the berm of the rain garden. You want to avoid vegetables and fruits that have a lot of uptake or that sit on the ground. So leafy greens like celery and lettuce, ground level berries like strawberries, um, leafy herbs, basil, oregano, root vegetables, things that are actually what you're eating is coming out of the ground. Um, things like melons and squash that sit on the ground rather than up on the vine. You want to avoid because your rainwater is going to have um, different things in it that won't be taken up through the plant, but you don't want to be watering right on the part of the plant that you're eating. So when you're, even when you're drip you're getting lettuce, that water is right on the lettuce and it uptakes everything. A really cool um, way to demonstrate this is if you take a piece of celery, cut it fresh, and put it in a cup of water with food coloring and watch it, that food coloring will run up the celery and into all the veins of the celery. Um, if you did the same thing with you know, the stalk of an artichoke and, you know, the roots of an artichoke and you watered it only with food colored watering, your artichoke is not going to change color. Um, your, your tomato is not going to change color if you're watering at the roots. And that's just a, a visual way to see how this uptake happens. Um, in the Bay Area, we have a pretty unique issue of annual forest fires and sometimes they're very severe. So for example, in 2020, we had the fires where the sky was bright orange all, all day. We, we never really saw the sun. It was just orange and eerie. And when we came out in the morning, our cars were all covered in ash and there was ash everywhere. And that was in our roofs and in our gutter systems. And then when we finally did get the rainfall, all of those chemicals from those fires, which included cars that burned and houses and and all of these these horrible chemicals other than just trees that had burned in these fires, they're concentrated then in, in that ash on our roofs. Um, so that's also one of those times where if you have a rainwater, you really want to disconnect your system and let that, you want to let that water run out a little bit um, and be able to soak into a wider area rather than just getting harnessed into your rain barrel. Um, with your rain garden, it's it shouldn't hurt anything because you're you're putting those native plants in the rain garden. It's going to filter through the dirt. It's going to filter through everything. But you don't want to be watering the leaves of the lettuce that you are about to eat with that water. So this is one of the reasons that I urge caution. Um, so you can use the harvested water for drip irrigation and to water at the roots but you want to avoid actually using the water on the parts of the plants you're going to eat. So you don't want to use harvested rainwater on root vegetables. And, you know, if you're going to water basil, you want to make sure you're at the roots or watering away from it. So these, these rules are pretty good for any harvested rainwater. Um, okay. Any any other questions on plants? So that essentially, edible plants can't be in the rain garden, but they can be on the berm. And this list is pretty pretty good rule to follow for a rain barrel as well. Um, so maintaining your garden, um, you want to irrigate during the dry months, especially when you first plant your garden. You want to irrigate them. I recommend drip irrigation. It's more targeted. You're going to use less water altogether. Um, just like with any garden, weed is needed. You know, check them regularly. Remove weeds as, as often as possible. I 
pick like two weeds every time I walk past my garden you know if I notice something I'll just pull it right then so that I don't have to come out and actually weed for an hour um you know when I see something coming up I just grab it uh, replace mulch as needed so this is the important one your mulch should always be two to three inches thick um, if you're using it in the swale part of your rain garden and not just on your berms you really want at least three inches thick uh, so replacing that it's going to break down it's going to become this nice composty dirt so you do need to replace your mulch and make sure that you're keeping up with that um you want to repair areas of erosion using splash block or cobbles is a great way to kind of break up the water as it's coming down out of your downspout to slow it down so it doesn't cause erosion Avoiding synthetic fertilizers and herbicides in your garden, um, since they're water pollutants, uh, avoiding them is going to make your water a little healthier. And then you want to just check and mitigate extended ponding. So you shouldn't have any extended ponding for more than three days. This means that, you know, if we have a big rainstorm and you notice it's ponding up and there's water in it, and then that rainstorm moves on, we don't have any rain, you shouldn't have three dry days where the water is still there. If we are still getting torrential rains three days in a row and the ponding stays through all three of those days of torrential rain, that's probably normal. There's a lot of water running. But once that rain stops, the ponding should go away. Um, you also want to clean your gutters twice a year. Just keep them clean. Uh, make sure that you don't have uh, extra debris coming in and getting clogged as it's running into your rain garden. So that is all that I have right now. I know I went a little bit fast because trying to cram a lot of information into one hour. So we do have some time now, about 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, these are three of the websites that I mentioned quite a bit. They have a lot of really great resources for rain gardens as well as rain barrels. And we'll send you some specific, specific sites in the follow-up email. Megan, I'm making that promise on your behalf. So I hope that was the plan. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. Very, a lot of knowledge and I know a lot was coming at you. So at this point in the presentation, you know, feel free uh, to just raise your hand. You can ask your question directly. I can unmute you or type it in the Q&A. Um, I'll kick things off here. I know you had gone over some of the plants that are not suitable, but do you have what's your favorite plant to put in a rain garden? Um, you mentioned some sedges. Is there something that you like in particular? So honestly, <laughs> this slide is all my favorites. Okay. Um, so I kind of picked like my four or five favorites in each category and threw them up here. I think they're all really beautiful. Um, they have a little bit more color than some of the other natives that are on the list. And they also have, you know, they, some of them, like the blue eyed grass, I, I have quite a few of them out front of my house and they just bloom for a much longer period than I expect. Every year I'm surprised at how long they are just, just beautiful. And they do really well getting dried and baked. My front yard gets incredibly hot. I'm, I'm right between two major highways and we get a lot of um, heat from just uh, refraction, re uh, reflection, reflected heat from all the blacktop. Mm -hmm. um, and my front yard is usually 10 degrees hotter than five miles down the road. <laughs> so um, it, it really does bake out my plants and blue eyed grass is incredible. It survived when I've, I've had so many other things not, not managed to survive here that I thought would. Um, so I do have a question here, and the question is asking if I have any input or thoughts about treating rainwater to be potable. Um, so for the purpose of this presentation and rainwater harvesting, we are looking at not using this as potable water, using this for our landscaping and for our irrigation. Um, there are ways that this can be treated um 
And if you look at other countries, especially um, Australia, they have their, I believe new builds in Australia actually require rainwater harvesting system as potable water to be installed. But like I was saying, we have a really unique issue in the Bay Area where we have these horrible wildfires. So we get very different pollutants in our rainwater than most areas in the world because we're dealing with these these pretty intense wildfires that we get here in the Bay Area in the fall. Uh, so I do not recommend doing this there are systems you can buy that you can treat them i have not done any of them okay this is a great question how do asphalt shingles impact or pollute rainwater um so asphalt shingles let's go back to the slide about roofs do 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 okay so asphalt shingles are a great question. When you get a new roof put on, you want to disconnect your rain barrel system if you get new asphalt shingles. The reason for that is when you put a new roof on and it rains, the first couple of rainstorms, asphalt shingles shed. So you get this little bits of asphalt and gravel and everything that come off. After that, once you clean your gutters, they really don't shed. Um, I've had people ask me about off-gassing from, from, from the asphalt shingles. I have read a lot of manufacturer specs on different shingles, and you can talk to, if you're getting a new roof put on, you can ask the manufacturer these questions, but most of them are completely safe. The water is not on the roof long enough for anything to leach into it. It is running off pretty quickly during the, the event. Um, and it's just that first couple of rainfalls when you have a new roof put on that you don't want to harvest from because that's what's going to have all the stuff that was loose when, loose when that new roof was put on. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, feel free, Patrick, to type in an, another question if you want me to to expand on that. Um, so I have, um, someone's trying to sum up, um, number one, you would send a link from where we buy the rainwater harvesting system. We're going to send you a link on where you can, can buy different systems. Number two, I need to DIY the system. What if I get stuck here? Number three, we send you the receipt and picture and you would send the rebate money is the is the understanding correct? How long will it take to get the rebate in the mail? Um, I'm going to answer the first two, Megan. I'm going to let you answer the rebate questions. Um, so yes, we're going to send you a link with some resources, um, not where you have to buy your rain system from. If you go on Amazon or Google and just search rain barrels, you're going to find thousands of different options and you're going to pick the one that appeals best to you. Uh, we will send you the link for Blue Barrel Systems. They're a local organization up in Santa Rosa that has designed kits for using those recycled barrels. Um, if you're going to do a DIY system, whatever barrel you choose will come with its kit and instructions. And if you get really stuck, my email will also be on the follow-up email and you can send me a picture of where you're stuck and I can type you a quick response. Um, to help you out. But for the most part, these symptom systems are very straightforward. Um, Flows to Bay does offer workshops pretty regularly. I'm hoping they're going to do one this year in January. If not, they'll have one next year where you can come out and do a hands-on installation and learn how to do these to give you a little more confidence before you do this at your own house. Uh, Megan, I'm going to have you go ahead and answer the rebate question. Yeah, Fahad, thank you so much for the question. So if you live in the Alameda County Water District Service Area, which is Fremont, Newark, and Union City, we offer a rain barrel rebate. Um, rain gardens are treated through our Lawn Be Gone rebate. So that's a more extensive process where you rip out your lawn and replace it, and you can include a rain garden in that. But if you're just looking for a simple rain barrel 
you can source your own, install it, take a photo and upload your receipt. And we offer you $50 per rain barrel, uh, up to two rain barrels. So you can get $100. That um, process can take anywhere from one to two weeks to process and then four to six to get your check in the mail because it goes through our accounting system. You get a physical check sent to you. Um, one thing I mentioned, if you're going to do the DIY, some of our customers like purchase a rain barrel on Craigslist and they don't have any proof, you know, they have, you know, uh, basically they paid in cash, they met someone. Um, so if you do find one or, you know, you want to document that you purchased something for at least up to $50, um, we can work with you and be flexible if, you know, it's a written agreement with the the purchase the person you paid purchased it from but if you do go through your um typical means like a store you'll want to save that receipt so i hope that that clears things up feel free to respond and we'll have a link to our rebate it's acwd.org forward slash rebates and you can find all the rain barrel information there but if you live outside of the service area then you can look on Bosca just because they they have all of the Bay Area water agencies rebates on that site. Okay, and now we have a clarification from the same participant. What I meant was, would the ones from Blue Barrel be DIY? Yes, Blue Barrel Systems is a DIY system. They can be installed singularly or daisy chained. Um, they look like this, and they um. They Blue Barrel has the most customer support out of any DIY rain barrel system in that they have this is their business that so they've made extensive videos on how to do this. They will send you a link to their video library. Um, you should not have any issues with the installation after watching their their DIY breakdowns. Um, so I have another question about roofs. Someone says that they have a hot mop roof or a foam flat roof, and they are wondering if that will work. Um, I am not sure what is meant by a hot mop roof. Megan, are you familiar with those? No, let me Google it really quick. Okay, we're going to see what Google says about a hot mop roof. Um, a foam flat roof is usually fine as with the rubber, rubber flat roofs. Um, the, the big concern there is figuring out where most of your water drains. Uh, some flat, flat roofs do not have downspouts. So if you don't have a gutter system and a downspout, you don't have a place to connect to. So some flat roofs, the water drains off the whole side of the flat roof, at which point you actually have nothing to connect to. So that's not going to work. Some flat roofs have a um, like a foam layer and the water comes through that and they have like a hole for a downspout and there actually is a downspout. As long as there's an actual downspout, you can connect to it. Um, again, you can reach out to the manufacturer and just confirm that you know, there aren't going to be pollutants in the water. You could also just get a sample tested. But most most of the foam foam flat roofs are and rubber flat roofs are totally fine. Megan, any luck about hot? Yeah, mops? it looks like it's pretty much similar to a flat flat roof in which um, plywood is like heated and welded on to where um, maybe like a commercial site would have a flat roof with some base sheets that are fastened on. Okay, so this sounds like maybe this is not something that would be used for a normal home. Um, I mean, I can share my screen. We can look at it together. <laughs> um, okay. I so I mean any any rain barrel installation at a commercial site is going to require a permit anyhow. Um so uh, if if this person wants to raise their hand and tell us a little bit about more about your own roof, where we can we'd be happy to talk about that. Does this look familiar? Kind of like flat and heated. Yeah. So what? Yeah. So this is this is um, 
it's a tar pro- process that's put on it and it is actually sealed um so it is it is sealed um if you're treating it regularly you want to make sure that you're not putting chemicals in um so another person says these are actually really common in san francisco city houses um megan i'm gonna share my screen again um let me see if i can make that work yeah that's interesting thanks for sharing that you know we can all learn um but yeah that it should be it should be inert once it's once it's installed again um you you may want to let the first couple rainfalls not be captured in a rain barrel because you you but you can talk to the manufacturer and just find out or the installer and find out if they if they feel like that's okay Any other questions, feel free to raise your hand or type them in the chat. Just a reminder, we will be, um, this is recorded. So if you want to refer back to any of the materials or slides, we'll be sending out a link um, to the recording as well as some of the resources that Chris has mentioned. Last chance for questions. Been some good ones so far. So thank you for those of you who have typed in your questions. Okay, we do have another one. Any drought friendly grass alternatives you recommend for rain garden? Um, so with the rain garden, you're you're gonna be planting let me let me get the uh let me see if i can pull up another rain garden picture so you're not gonna be like planting a ton of grasses you're gonna have plants um kind of scattered throughout so um like i maybe because i have juncus which is is kind of a, a rush or or grass in this picture maybe that's confusing um, but you can do, you can pick which plants you want in the rain garden, but it's not going to be a lawn um, at the point that you're doing a rain garden. They are going to be spaced out plants. I, I, I'm not sure I, I, um, I'm not sure I'm answering that question correctly. I'm not sure about the intent of the question. If you want to clarify, I can try again. <laughs> okay. So I'm glad that helps. <laughs> But yeah, yeah a, rain, a rain garden will not look like a lawn. You, you do not, it, it will definitely be different than a lawn. I'm going to go back to the anatomy slide. Yeah, part of the goal of a lot of the Bay Area conservation programs are really to have people rethink some of what they consider beauty that, you know, green, lush grass and things like that. Um, there's so many beautiful alternatives that can be so much more environmentally friendly, like the drought tolerant native species and the rain gardens and things that can kind of treat your residents as like a watershed. That being said, there are like low water use grasses, like sedges and things. And some of that you can see in the picture that are like tall grasses that are drought tolerant. but they don't necessarily look like a green lawn, right? Oh, this is a great question. So we have a question here. If you have dogs, are there any concerns we should be aware of of having a rain garden? And that's actually a really great question. Um, most of our native, I can't, I, I, someone actually asked me this earlier today when I was, I was doing an assessment at their house and I had um, three other local environmental staff uh, folks from from other programs there with me and none of us could think of any native plants that are poisonous for dogs um there are a lot of decorative plants that you would never put in your rain garden that are poisonous to dogs so it is something definitely to think about 
but I've not been able to think of any native plants that you would be putting in your rain garden that would have an issue with a dog. So your dog should be fine. Um, if your dog really likes to run, I would recommend instead of doing river rocks in that top bit to use mulch and it would just end up being like a six inch indentation with the drainage. You're, uh, you dig down still your 12 inches. You would do, um, you know, three inches of, of drainage rock, three inches of biosoil soil. And then instead of the river rocks on top, you would do mulch. And that would be easier if the dog's running full speed. Spat, my dog spazzes out pretty much at nine o'clock every night. Um, and so in if you're going to do this in a backyard or an area where the dog's off leash regularly, um, rather than having the, the cobbles, which might be a trip hazard, just putting mulch in is, is going to make it a little bit safer for them. Um, I'm very conscious of this. My dog had to have surgery on her leg last year because she tripped in a hole at my mom's house. Um, so that's something I'm very conscious of as a dog owner. Uh, but as far as the plants go, I can't think of any native plants that you'd be putting in the rain garden that would be on that Bosco list that are going to be harmful. So they should be totally safe. Would the dogs drink them? Okay. We have someone who does have more experience with the dogs. Um, they said yarrow and iris are toxic for dogs if they eat it. And they think that there are a few more. Thank you very much. Because I, I did not know that yarrow is toxic for dogs. And I definitely didn't know about the iris. Um, the one I see in most people's yard is, that's toxic is azalea. And uh, that's not a native or not, a, not something you'd put in a rain garden. So yarrow and iris are ones to avoid for dogs. And you can definitely, um, as you're planning your rain garden, look at the plants that are recommended through Bosca's site. And then you can search each plant you're planning on put it, putting in and just find out if it's okay for the dogs. Um, okay, so thank you for Louise for letting us know that. And then I have a question here for the rebates again, Megan. This question is, I can't figure out on the Bosco website whether there are any rebates available in parts of Alameda County like San Leandro or Oakland is only Hayward covered in Alameda County. Yeah, so for you'll want to know who your water provider is and look for their rebates through them. Bosca has 26 water providers, but cities like San Leandro and Oakland are served by the East Bay Municipal Utility District, and they are not, not Potter Bosca. So you would go um, to their website and see what rebates they offer. Um, Hayward is in Alameda County, but the city of Hayward actually serves water to them. So our name, the Alameda County Water District, is not very intuitive. It really should be the Alameda Creek Water District because that's really where we came from. We only serve Fremont, Newark, and Union City. We don't serve the whole county, so it can get confusing. Um, but if you have any other cities, I can help point uh, you to what water district may provide services to them. But East Maybe Municipal Utility District for San Leandro and Oakland and City of Hayward for Hayward. All right. Thank you, Megan. That was super helpful because that is really confusing. Um, Louise just shared the ASPCA dogs plant control list. I'm going to copy this into the chat. Um, so everyone should be able to see this. Um, so thank you very much. So this is plants that are toxic for dogs. Um, so if your dog tends to eat plants, I'm very blessed. My dog only trips on things. She doesn't actually eat plants. Um, but this will, this plant list that's in the chat now, uh, will help folks figure out which plants to avoid. And that's good, not just with native plants, but for any plants you're thinking about putting in your backyard, if you have a dog that you let out there un unwatched. All right. Well, thank you all so much for the participation. We are at eight, so we'll go ahead and close the webinar, but 
as stated, you know, we'll be sending out a list of resources along with our contact information, my contact information, if you have any further questions. Um, Chris, do you have any final parting wisdom for us? <laughs> no, we'll, uh, we'll probably send out the uh, follow-up email next week and we'll make sure we have all those nice links on there for you. Thank you again for spending your evening with us and have a great um, rest of your day. Um, there's Sorry, there's one more note, dog. Uh, they said to avoid grasses with foxtail. Uh, fo the the main glass that's an issue, which which is or the main foxtail that's an issue is a very invasive species. So you really don't want to plant that anyhow um, for any reasons. But yeah, foxtails can get embedded in the dog skin. Sorry, I can get sidetracked on dogs all day long. <laughs> that's a good pro tip. I think it's really helpful. So, but yeah, farmer's foxtail, super invasive, really don't want to see it anywhere. It's it's sad that it is everywhere and it's mm -hmm. hard to get rid of. Great. With that note, make sure your plants are dog friendly. <laughs> um, thank you again and have a great rest of your night. Thanks, Chris. Good night. Thank you.